Shabbat Shalom and welcome to the book of Acts now, Ecclesia. We're here today in His presence. He's calling and He's talking to us. Let Him talk to you out there today as His word comes forth. I keep hearing a call, a call. He's calling for those that will be warriors in His army. Those that will call, uh, actually just come and repent and turn to Him. There's a call going forth today. Won't you answer that call? Are you going to? I'm asking. There's a call coming from heaven that says, Come out of Babylon, my children, my people. We need to answer, answer this, His call today. And we ask that you answer as you hear from the Word of God here today. Our pastor, Bishop Jerry Bowers is coming with the precious Holy Word. Let it be an encouragement to you. Let it be give you a courage and a boldness that you will rise and stand for His glory. This is what we're asking today. So receive from Him today as you hear His precious Word. Amen, amen. Amen, amen. Thank you, Apostle Homer. Glory to God. Glad to be in the house of the Lord Amen. and to hear His Word. Amen. Father, we ask that You will bless the reading and the proclamation of Your Word. Bring it forth with the power of Your Holy Spirit. And bring it forth, Father, with Your glory. We pray in Christ Yeshua's name. Amen and amen. amen. Hallelujah. Amen. The title of my sermon today is Acts Glory Re Revolution. Are you ready for some revolution today? We need the revolution of God's kingdom, don't we? Especially in this world today. Hallelujah. Open your Bible to Acts chapter 1. We pick up this account as something we're familiar with. At verse 4, it says, Being assembled together with them, Yeshua, He commanded them not to depart Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. Yes. Which he said, you have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water. But you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Not many days from now. Amen. You know what's interesting about what's happening here is. The disciples have gone through a tremendous Bible school course. For three and a half years they've been in training. They're graduating. Now, you know, when you go to our, our uh, schools, you get degrees and diplomas, right? Typically, if you go through a four-year Bible school, you get a bachelor's degree. If you go two more years, you get a master's degree. These guys were graduating. You know what kind of degree they were getting? The master was graduating them, so they were getting a master's degree. Amen. But they still didn't have a clue what they're supposed to do. You know how come I know that? Look with me at verse 6. So in, in verse 6, Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? Now, if you look this up in the original language, it says they kept on saying to him. You know, the Lord was with them for 40 days after the resurrection. Can you imagine? If they keep showing every time they see him, Lord, Lord, is this the time you're going to deliver us from Rome and, and restore Israel and we'll get to rule and reign and, and defeat them? Lord, is this the time? And you know, pretty soon the Lord is like saying, you know what? I'm out of here. I've, I'm going back home. You guys, you still don't get it. He said, I, I, want to, I want you to lock yourself in this room and I want you to press in until you do get it. And then you're going to get the Holy Spirit. Why did it take them 10 days to get it? I'm going to tell you why. Because their theological ideas and views were keeping them from seeing the reality of what God wanted to do with His glory and with His Spirit in the earth through His kingdom and not man-made ideas. Amen. That's still a problem today. That's why we have so many different churches, different ideas and theologies. Hey, I got an idea. Why don't we just all go back to the book of Acts, to the original blueprint, take that priority, that passion, and that word, and preach that, Amen. and be with God. Amen. Maybe we wouldn't have all these denominations. But there's a truth here that, that we need to get. 
because God wanted them to have a revelation of His glory. So He said, wait for the promise of the Father. Now, what's that about? Well, the promise of the Father, which was spoken over in Luke 24, had to do with clothing them with power and pouring out the Holy Spirit. As He said here, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Wow. The promise of the Father. How do we get the promise of the Father? How do we get the glory revolution? How do we experience that? Go with me to Matthew chapter 6, beloved, because we're going to get some revelation of the glory. we got to have it. we got to have it. Amen. Somebody say, Lord, give us more glory. Amen. Matthew chapter 6. This is familiar. It's talking about the Lord's Prayer, right? And so it says <clears throat> in verse 6, Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room or your closet, and when you have shut the door, pray to your Father who's in the secret place. So what he's trying to tell us, friends, there is a secret in the secret place, and most of the church doesn't know this about the secret. Amen. You know what the secret is? The Father is in there and waiting for you. In fact, some of us, for some of us, the Father has been in there waiting for us all of our lives, and we've never made it into there to be with Him. But this is important. There's a couple of key things here, key concepts that we need to get. Number one, if you're going to go in there and experience the Father and the glory of God, do you realize that the Bible says God's an all-consuming fire? That's true. In, in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. He is an all-consuming fire. That's our God. And so if you're in there with Him, there's no reason why you can't be walking around with the fire of God and the glory of God. But we're not walking around with the glory of God because we're not spending time with Him in the secret place. Now, I'm, I'm just telling the truth. We all struggle with this because the devil wants to keep us out of there. Okay, so the number one hindrance that keeps us from gaining that glory and that fire is we haven't discovered this key to the glory. And this key to the glory is simply this. you got to close the door. That means you got to turn off CNN and Fox News. Talk to somebody. That means you got to turn off all the prophets and different people and on the media stuff. you got talking heads everywhere. we got to turn off the mass media and tune in to God. Amen. And He only has one address that God told us to tune into in order to connect with Him, and it's called the closet. And what it means by closing the door, beloved, is it means that we have to tune out the world. That means we've got to turn off every distraction. And you know, that's tough. Especially if you've got the TV on all day. But that, it's really tough to do that, because the moment we wake up, our minds are so programmed... I'm sure, Vondel, that in 1920 or whatever, back, you know, we turned the clock back, they didn't have all the distractions we have. Most of them didn't even have radios. No televisions, and everything was kind of a slower pace. You know, we're going to milk the cows this morning. You know, we're going to feed the dogs, and Mama's going to have breakfast for us about 8 or, you know, 9 o'clock, and, and, uh, and then she's going to start on lunch because it takes like three hours to prepare a meal. And so, you know, the whole thing was slowed down. The phone's not ringing. The there were no cell phones. There was no internet. You don't have to get on the internet. See what they're doing in China. You just focus on what God's doing in your world. Amen. But our lives have become so complicated that it's difficult not to be tuned in to all of these things at one time that we're multitasking. And in the process of multitasking, we don't task God all the way out of it. Amen. <laughs> I'm just telling you the truth, you know. This is the problem. And so... Here's my solution. And maybe my solution is not going to be yours. But look, I've decided I'm going to get a Moses attitude about the whole thing. And the Moses attitude is, take me not up out of this place, out of this bed, until your glory comes down upon me and I get a touch from heaven. I'm not getting up and doing anything. Put on some Terry McCollum or whatever worship music you like. That's what I like. And I get my hands up, and I worship God, and I don't get up until I get a touch from God. If we would do this, we would find that our days would be changed dramatically. And God would be delivering us from some things. You know, I'm just telling you the truth. So, what causes the Holy Spirit to come down? 
it's the presence of God. And the disciples had to discover how to tap into that in the upper room so that the Holy Spirit could come down in Acts 1.8. The power of God would activate their gifts so they could go out. Go with me to Psalms 91. Psalms, the 91st chapter. That's one of my favorite psalms. How about you? He who dwells in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. And I will say of the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God in whom I trust. Surely He shall deliver you from the snare of the fowler. Wow. Well, let me tell you a couple things about this passage. It, it's like what Christ talked about. You're going into the secret place and close the door. You're abiding under the wings of the shadow of the Almighty, which is El Shaddai. And the enemy can't touch you in that place. And then when you come out of that place, and this is what most believers don't understand. When you come out of that place, the glory comes out with you. And if the glory comes out with you, he will rescue your feet from the snare of the fowlers because God doesn't allow anybody to grab you when the glory's on you. Amen. If we would just take that time to enter the glory of the morning. And not only that, he says, when, as you're marching through your day and you're doing whatever you're doing, I don't care if you're doing laundry or mowing the lawn or whatever it is you're doing. When you're in the secret place, you see, this is a reputation of the Ark of the Covenant up here, right? Get the mercy seat where the mercy of God is. And the wings of the cherubim are like this, covering the mercy seat. What Psalms 91 is saying is this. When you're in my presence, you come into the secret place, you're covered by my wings. Amen. Shoot! The wings of the cherubim over you. Now you walk out of the secret place, and you're on your way to do your thing. Shoot! The wings of the cherubim are still over you. Amen. That's why you get delivered and your feet get protected. That's why it says no evil thing will come nigh into thy dwelling. That's better protection than a vaccine. Because the wings are protecting you. And I will tell you my conviction and belief. This crown virus thing is a spirit. It's a part of witchcraft. It's been invented by man to destroy and kill and take life and manipulate and control. And that's witchcraft. And there's spirits attached to it. I've checked this out and praying with people. There's a spirit of congestion, spirit of fear, spirit of anxiety, uh, blood clots. These are all things that are connected with that spirit that's called the crown virus. Why would they call it a crown virus? Because the devil wants to use it as a crown to bring in his army and his other spirits to destroy life. He's crowning that one affliction sickness to take out as many people as he can, especially God's people. Amen. And we got to discover our weapons. Now let me tell you what the greatest weapon is against the crown virus. 2,000 years ago on Mount Calvary, our Savior put on a crown. And his crown that he wore on that cross, his crown cancels the crown Amen. virus. Amen. And so when we pray with somebody that's being attacked by the crown virus, here's how we do that. We come against you in the name of Christ Yeshua, Almighty God, who wore that crown of thorns for me on Calvary, and we rebuke the crown that's on this virus, and we dethrone you, and we cast you out, and you get out of the life of that person. Amen. we got to get mad at that thing Amen. and speak to it. Not only that, when you go out, you take your congestion and your blood clots and, yes. and all the fear and anxiety and fear of death and all those things you're putting on people. We will not tolerate that and we will not walk in that because our king wore a crown for us. Amen. We don't have to tolerate you and your crown. Hallelujah. Come on now. We, we need to take authority in the body of Christ over the attacks of the enemy Amen. and act like we got some authority because we do. Man, I'm just telling you the truth and that's when the glory comes into play. In Acts chapter 3, let's go back over to Acts. We might start preaching. In Acts chapter 3, we see the disciples, now they finally got it. Took them 10 days to close the door. They finally got the glory and the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. And now they're coming to the seven mountains. It's time to go out to the, to the marketplace and visit the seven mountains of influence. 
and, and to bring the mountain of God. You know what the Bible says? Now, some of you, this may be a new concept, but the, the Bible talks about mountains. And there are mountains of influence, or we might call them gates. It's the same thing. There's the gate of the church, the family, education, business, entertainment and arts, media, which is a gate that desperately needs to be redeemed. Government. All of them need to be redeemed. But here's here's an interesting thing. When you're looking around at both in in, uh, in Isaiah, but in the little book of Micah, it says that God's going to raise up. He's going to raise up um, uh, the mountain of the church, and that His mountain of the church is going to cause all other mountains to flow. Somebody say flow, flow to the mountain of the Lord. Yeah. Are you ready to see that? And one translation says those other mountains are going to flow like a river unto the mountain of the Lord. Wow. I can't wait to see that happen. Yeah, here it is. It's in Micah 4, 1. Now, it shall come to pass in the latter days. Somebody say latter days. That's, that's where we're living, right? It shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established on top of all the other mountains and be exalted above the hills and the peoples shall flow to it and many nations shall come and say, come let us go to the mountain of the Lord. Listen, there are some mountains that are out of whack and some mountains that are bringing destruction in the earth, the mountains of evil and influence uh, on the left and on the right. But God says, look, I'm going to do work in the last days. I'm going to cause my mountain with its glory to rise up. And it's going to be so seen and so powerful that all the other mountains like a river will flow to my mountain. Amen. I'm ready for that. That's, that's a glory revolution. When that happens, we're having a glory revolution. So now in the book of Acts, uh, we begin to see God at work. Amen. Uh, so when they came to the to uh, the gate of the church or the mountain of the church there at the temple and uh, in Acts three, remember the story where Peter comes and said, and the guy that's that's lame and has never walked a day in his life, he's over forty years old. Have you got some alms? I need some money. Homeless man. And he said, silver and gold I don't have, but what I do have, I'm gonna pour out on you. What did he have? He had the glory. He'd been in the presence of God. He was filled with the glory. He released some glory. And the man was healed. And it says that immediately his legs and, and his feet were strengthened. Now, if you've ever seen somebody that hasn't walked, usually their limbs are like toothpicks. There was no muscle developed. There was no strength there to do anything. But he is so restored, he's got perfectly formed muscles. In fact, he can not only get up, he can jump. He can run. He can shout. And he runs into the temple and begins to shout, Glory! I'm having a glory revolution! Yeah. They knew who he was. Because they seen him there. Week in and week out for 40 years. That's Crazy John. Look at that. Crazy John is on his feet and running and shouting. What happened to you, Crazy John? Well, this man, Yeshua. Through these... Disciples made me whole. And you all need him. You all need some of this glory. You all need some of this touch from God. And it says 5,000 people believe and they turn to Christ. That's just only one testimony. Whew. We, we need some glory to bring some glory testimonies so we can see a harvest. Amen. <clears throat> now when you go through the book of Acts... Why don't we just sum up the book of Acts like this? The whole book of Acts is about a glory revolution. Amen. And everywhere the disciples are going, you're seeing the glory. Amen. The glory's on display. They done forgot about their theological arguments and hang-ups. They stopped arguing about doctrine. And who's going to be the greatest and put aside pride. And decided they're going to exalt Christ. Come on. What if the churches would do that today? Oh, my goodness. And so if you look through the book of Acts, you know, you can see these, these snapshots. Amen. Um, so, for example, in Acts chapter 7, we have the, the chapter 6, we have this, the seven deacons that 
They lay hands on them, set them aside to feed the widows. And then they start going out and revealing the glory. And you don't see them waiting tables. You see them out doing what the apostles are doing. So at Acts 7, old Stephen, he starts preaching in the gates. He starts declaring who Christ is. And they have to stone him and put him to death to shut him up. Hey, Stephen, you haven't been to Bible school one day and haven't been to seminary. Who told you could do that? Come on now, the glory came on me and I couldn't help it. I had to speak up. Amen. That's the glory revolution. And then we have old uh, Philip. He goes down to Samaria and it says he turned the whole city upside down. He starts laying hands and preaching and people are getting delivered of demonic spirits. People who have been lame and palsy and all of a sudden they are restored and made whole. And they're delivered from the oppression of the enemy. And it says the whole city was filled with joy. What, why don't we just have a glory revolution and fill our cities with joy? Amen. Maybe we'll forget about our differences and forget about all the doctrine and realize it's really about Him. Come on. Yes, Lord. I'm speaking the truth to somebody here. Wow. And so in chapter 8, verse 18, along comes a guy by the name of Simon. He's called Simon the Sorcerer in, uh, in Acts 8, 18. And he sees all this. He was famous for all the magic he could do. But he realized, hey, this is the real deal. You know, this is not sleight of hand. This is the real deal. So he accepts the gospel. He's baptized and joins. But then, he, because he really wants this and he likes having power, uh, he, try, he makes a proposition. In verse 18 of uh, Acts 8. And when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone whom I lay hands on will receive the Holy Ghost. How do you get the baptism of the Holy Spirit? You get it through the laying on of hands. And then Peter said to him, Your money perish and die with you, because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with your money. Well, that upset the old sorcerer. And he said, no, 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 no. Forgive me. I'm sorry. Please. I repent. Pray for me that God won't kill me. <laughs> he did. He repented. This is a glory revolution. And then you see, Paul is going the wrong direction, doing the wrong thing, because he got the wrong theology. And he's on the road to Damascus to try to stamp out the, the followers of the way. Followers of Christ. And he's going, to, he's going to beat them. He's going to persecute them and lock them up. And he thinks he's doing God's will. With all his heart. He thinks he's doing the right thing. And you know. He, he, the glory of the Lord all of a sudden appears. And is so bright. He, he's blinded by the brightness. He can't see. He falls off his horse. And he's on the ground. And a voice speaks to him and says. Paul. Paul. He's like. I can't see nothing but I hear a voice. What, 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 Lord? Why are you persecuting me, Paul? Who are you? I'm Jesus, Yeshua, Hamashiach. I'm the one you're persecuting, Paul. What do I do? What do I do? You're going to go on into the city and wait until I send somebody for you. So three days he fasts and prays. He doesn't do anything, just seeking God. Saying, I don't know why I did all those things. I'm so sorry. He's going through a time of repentance. He's got to lose his physical eyes so his spiritual eyes can see. Yeah? Sometimes the Lord has to do that. He's got to take away all of the stuff that's blinding us. And so he sends a man there to lay his hands on him. The scales fall off his eyes. He's raised up, becomes a powerful apostle. But you know what this tells, what this tells me, which is so neat. You could be going the wrong road on the wrong way and fighting God and the glory will find you and overtake you. You could be like the guy at the gate, beautiful, and your feet are dead and you're not able to walk in God's ways and you're all caught up with drugs and all caught up with addictions and you can't seem to do anything because your walk is dead. And God says, I specialize in reviving walk. I specialize in reviving dead feet. Just one touch from the master. It all can change. That's what we see in the book of Acts. It's a, it's a glory revolution. Acts chapter 12, we have Peter. He's locked up in prison because they're planning after the feast to kill him. 
uh, because they had already killed one of the disciples, James, and, and uh, the religious leaders loved it. So he said, well, I'm going to give him another gift. You know, when we get past this feast, this holiday, we're, we're going to kill Peter, and that will make him happy. So Peter, they, some of them have escaped previously, right? So they got Peter locked between two big old Roman guards, you know. These, these are like WrestleMania nuts. These are all muscled up Roman guards. And they got the shackles and chains on Peter and on the guards. And I can imagine the guards, you know, they're, they're sleeping. They're probably snoring, you know. And, and old Peter's like, he's awake. He's like, oh, thank you, Lord. I'm praising you, God. I don't know how you're going to get me out of this because I, these shackles got locks on them. That gate, that door has a lock on it. And then the prison has a lock on it. But Lord, that's no match for you. One touch of glory. An angel shows up and the shackles, the locked shackles fall off the wrist and the ankles. It doesn't even wake up the Roman guards who are still snoring. And the angel goes, get up. Now he's thinking he's dreaming. Now, this, is, this is weird, but I like it. It's a good dream. Okay, so the angel goes over and and uh, does this and the and the locked door to the prison cell opens he goes out to the locked door of the the jail itself and does this and that door opens they get to the city and it's got a locked gate a big old metal gate he does this and that opens and all of a sudden he looks around and he says wait a minute this is not a dream this is for real now the church is praying for him see They've been praying constantly and continually that God would, inter would intervene and deliver him and the glory showed up. Because when the angels show up, the glory comes. And so he goes and knocks on their door to tell them, your prayer has been answered, people. But you know what? They're so scared that when Rhoda came to check out who's knocking at the door and saw him, she went, ah, that must be a ghost that can't be real. Sometimes we don't know how to receive our miracles. So she goes back in and says, I don't know what's going on, but I think I saw Peter out there at the gate. No, no, that was his ghost. That can't be right. He keeps knocking, right? And they hear this, hey, hey, hey. They hear this knocking. Finally, they go out and it's like, glory be, it is Peter. They didn't know how to believe God for a miracle. And that's part of our problem today in the church. We pray for stuff, but we don't know how to receive the miracles. That's what was going on. But there's a glory revolution that's overtaking everything that they're doing, including deliverance. And what, this story, what these stories are saying to us today, we need to be determined like the disciples of old, because they finally got it. You realize after they experienced that in the upper room, they would not start one more day or one more activity without prayer and experiencing God. That's why you see them in Acts chapter 13. And they got, they, Lord, we don't know what the next assignment is. Well, I know what we'll do. Let's get together and pray, fast and pray. And let's do what Margie's been suggesting and have an all-night prayer session on the first Friday of the month or something. And let's seek God until we hear something. And make sure God's in it. Well, that's what they did in Acts chapter 13. And that's when God showed up. The Holy Spirit showed up and said, Set aside um, Paul and Barnabas. I've got a mission for them. And they get sent out, you know, to Asia, to these different countries on a special mission. That happened because they entered the glory. See, they realized in the upper room, if you're going to do anything that matters... You need to hear from God and have the glory and the revelation of God involved in what it is you're doing. And that's true corporately for us, but it's also true for us individually. There are times when we need to stop what we're doing and do that, and we'll become like a Moses. You'll get the what I call the Moses attitude. I'm not coming up out of here until your glory touches me. Take me not up out of this place Unless your glory goes before me and comes down. Amen. And the glory came down. Listen, test it out tomorrow morning. Before you get up, put on some worship. Get your head out of all the stuff that's waiting for you. Forget about your email. Get your worship mind on. Get your hands in the air and begin to worship God and say, Lord, I need a touch. I need a revelation of your glory.
I need to know that your presence and anointing in the secret place is on me so I can walk in the secret place today. Would you do that tomorrow morning? And then start making it a habit. Now, not only will it revolutionize your walk, and you'll see God delivering you from some stuff, it will re revolutionize this church. Because all of you are coming back here carrying some glory. And bringing it all over to one place. So, please, I'm telling you, before our next service, please, get into the glory before you show up here. So that we're not doing the flesh program, but we're flowing in, in the power and the, and the glory of God. Yes? Yeah. And if you'll do that, Marge, you'll get her flags out, and, and we'll just start praising God, and we'll let Him take over. Amen? Yeah, so I've enjoyed the service today. I like it when the Holy, when the Holy Spirit comes and shows up and just begins to, to orchestrate what we're doing. During worship, those of you who are listening online, you didn't know this, we just stopped worshiping, and we said, God, what do you want us to know? And God began to speak and give prophetic words. That's God interacting with His people. That's the glory. That is the glory revolution where God comes into our midst, takes over, and begins to speak what He wants for us to hear, and we get His heart. That's the glory. Let's ask God to manifest that this week. Father, I just want to ask, for those listening online, for those of us who are here, that you'll give us a glory revolution in our lives. That we can be a part of the solution that causes the mountain of the Lord. And Micah 4.1. The mountain of the Lord to rise up above all the other mountains. Yes. And their influences. And that mountain will cause the other mountains to flow to the house of the Lord. Yes, Thank you Lord God for your divine revelation today. Thank you for giving us the desire and the hunger to seek you. And to have that Moses attitude. That I'm not getting up and going anywhere until I have a touch from heaven. Thank you, Father, for, for rewarding that and for blessing us as we seek your face this week. And Lord, we want to be used of heaven. We want to see that same revolution in our day where you start transforming our world and, and other lives. Amen. We can just walk into a room or, or into a setting and people will get healed. We'll accidentally bump into somebody at Walmart and cancer will fall off. Because the glory is getting loose in the city. God bless us and show us what can be so that our reality and our worldview is not based on CNN, but our reality and worldview is based on the glory. Thank you for blessing us today. We pray in Christ's name. Amen, amen. Thank <laughs> you.